Okay, good morning, everybody. We got a big crowd joining in from all over the country today. Uh, today, we're going to tackle what we can already see for the fourth quarter real estate market. The, there are real changes happening now in the data and around the country. Some of the local markets are behaving differently from others. And... Get my. Uh, some of the local markets are be behaving differently from others. And so we're going to spend some time on those, looking at seeing which ones are being more interest rate sensitive and which ones are being uh, more resilient, because we can see both of those kinds of markets in, in uh, across the country today. So uh, let's dive right in today. There's so much going on and some really, really uh, tricky points. We're, we're going to try to, as always, talk about how to interpret the data, how to communicate with buyers and sellers right now. We, uh, I will share what we already know for prices and inventory for the rest of the year. We do have some, some uh, mortgage rates at their multi-decade high. They do not seem to be easing down. We were hoping they would by the end of the year, but we don't see that. Uh, we saw, um, we have new Fed news and we have new expectations for mortgage rates and interest rates for the for the next year, and that's really impacting uh, home buyers and sellers right now. And I'll show you where we can see that. Uh, we're looking at the pending and the sales trends because we're also uh, the August sales data is out, and in the Altos data we can see what we're what we already know for September and for the rest of the year for those uh, those headlines. Uh, and then, like I mentioned, we're going to do some local markets. So well, we got a lot to cover. So let's dive right in. Before I get to the data, there's a couple of things I'd like to share with you. You may be familiar with the Altos Top of Mind podcast. In the it, This is where I interview uh, leaders in the industry. Um, we also have a new podcast at Altos, which is uh, how, called House of Data. And this is where we're actually diving into real practitioners with real estate data, those who are able to forecast and understand the markets and, and understand their businesses in ways that maybe um, are really innovative or really insightful. Alex Bridgman on the Altos team is hosting that. Alex is a really skilled podcaster uh, and, and he's an excellent interviewer. So if you really want to geek out, join us on the House of Data podcast uh, as well. Um, as always on these webinars, Lael and Jeff from the Altos team are in the chat. So use the chat box to to share uh, to ask questions. When I'm uh, when I talk about things like, for example, these podcasts, we have links to uh, you may have links that that uh, Lael and Jeff will share that you can go click through and and go connect and download. Uh, if you haven't been listening to the Altos podcast, there's, there's there'll be a link in the uh, in the chat to go to go grab those. Altos Research, of course, tracks every home for sale in the country every week. We track all the pricing, all the supply and demand, all the changes in that data, and we make it available to you before you see it in the traditional channels. So when we do these webinars, we're trying to learn, looking at all the data across all of the, the areas, diving in as deep as we can. Uh, and when you want to learn about how to communicate with the data, talk about the data in many of the ways I do, uh, tackle the data points that I do with your clients. If you haven't already done so, you can grab the free Altos ebook, How to Use Market Data in Your Real Estate Business. Uh, there will be a link in the chat for you to go get that. Uh, Leo will share that there. Uh, and that gives you scripts. It gives you ideas, how to communicate, strategies, uh, how to understand some of the data points that maybe uh, you know you're less familiar with. So go grab that ebook if you haven't gotten it already. Go grab that ebook because it's really useful in communicating about the data with your buyers and sellers right now. All right, let's dive into the data. Let's start with inventory. There are 518,000 single-family homes available on the market this week. That's up 2% over last week. A 2% climb in inventory in September is actually 
pretty unusual. You could see uh, in this chart, every every line is a year, the curve for the year. And the curve usually peaks like by the end of August and starts ticking down in September. Last year, the light red line is last year. You can see right where we are la uh, at this point last year, we had this spike in mortgage rates from like in the mid, mid to low sixes to seven to seven and a half. And that really cooled the market down in the fourth quarter of last year. So you could see between the second and third week of September last year, inventory ticked up. It started a new, it had crested for the year, but it had started, resumed a climb. And that really had that cold for fourth quarter, which spilled over into the first quarter of this year. What we're seeing right now is we this year we had, we had declining inventory mo most of the year. We had more buyers than sellers most of the year. And then interest rates in June and July started going from the sixes and up into the sevens to seven and a half again. And, uh, and so now we're looking at the higher rates, uh, which obviously impacts affordability and therefore makes uh, buyers hold off. Uh, there's a notable shift, I think, in psychology that we've been talking about recently, which is earlier in the year, we could see buyers who are looking at, let's say, the mortgage rates in March or April or May were 6 percent, six and a half percent. Those buyers were saying, OK, I can get approved for this mortgage and make these payments, uh, but I am anticipating in the the pundits, the conventional wisdom was that the economy was going to slow interest rates with the Fed would drop interest rates uh, by by 2024. Mortgage rates would probably be lower back maybe in the fives. And if I'm buying at six and a half, I could refinance in the future and therefore my house would get cheaper. So I think that was motivating a lot of purchasers in that math was motivating a lot of purchasers earlier in the year. Suddenly, though, in the last few weeks, six weeks, maybe, suddenly the zeitgeist is changing. The The expectations now for 2024 that, uh, that the Fed will maybe not cut interest rates at all. Like the economy has been much stronger than anybody anticipated uh, 10, 12 months ago. And there's we're still at full employment. In fact, unemployment fell today. Uh, so it seems in the latest report. So these signals are a strong economy, uh, which means for our mortgage rates, like that, that the expectations now are for buyers are like, I'm looking at seven, seven point three percent mortgage rates. And now I expect that next year, what if they're at eight? So now I can't buy with that refinance expectation, or I'm not, I have fewer people are doing that right now. And so as a result, now it's September and inventory actually grew this year faster than it did last th this same week last year, uh, which is a little alarming because of how cold it got last year. I think, though, that that's uh, we will will have um, not as big a spike, you know, till late October, unless rates keep climbing right now. Rates go towards 8 percent. You'll see the same curve as last year, more uh, inventory climbing. Uh, and then will decline for the rest of the year. And I'm going to share this chart. I've been sharing it for the last couple of webinars. This is a little busy, but here's what we've got here. The gray line here is inventory trends over multiple years, uh, eight, nine years. And you can see each year in the gray line, inventory has been generally falling over the last decade. Uh, and and what, what, I'm, what we want to illustrate here is really the answer to the question, when will we get more inventory? When will inventory build? And one of the answers to that question is that inventory will climb as rates climb. So uh, there's conventional wisdom sometimes still out there that uh, mortgage rates need to fall before we get more housing inventory. Then be, people are locked into their mortgages and so they'll be able to move once rates fall again. But the data shows the opposite is true, that that actually uh, inventory builds when rates go up and inventory falls when rates go down. And, and so what this chart shows us is over the last decade, rates have been generally low, inventory has been falling. In January 2020, uh, during the year 2020, rates fell dramatically. That's the 
mortgage rates are the, the the colored line down there and the yellow in the middle there, that's 2020 year. Uh, in 2020, rates fell, inventory fell dramatically. Last year, in, rates spiked, inventory spiked. This year, it rates had fallen from their peak or in the first half of the year, inventory had fallen. Uh, and now mortgage rates are climbing and inventory is climbing again, late in the summer for that. So when people ask the question, when home buyers and sellers ask the question, when are we going to see more inventory? The answer is the data shows us that it takes higher rates for longer in order for inventory to build. The, answer, the reason for that is holding costs. It is when, when rates are low, it is much cheaper for me to hold more real estate. So I hold it and I don't sell it. When rates are higher, the holding costs are higher. So we have to sell more to finance the next deal or for whatever reason. So, uh, so higher rates gives us higher inventory over time. And it took us a decade to get to these record low levels, a decade of really low rates to get to the really low levels. So you can imagine that it might take multiple years for inventory to build back up. So we're at high, we're at multi-decade highs in mortgage rates right now. We have in, uh, inventory climbing late in the year. And so you can imagine that next year when we start talking about the forecast of inventory, uh, inventory, if rates stay in the sevens or maybe even cross over eight, if the economy stays strong and employment stays strong like it has been, you could imagine a scenario where we see 8% mortgage rates. And if rates climb, that would imply inventory climbing for 2024. Uh, right now, this is the this is the forecast for the rest of the year. So we have, we currently have 500 and uh, some thousand single family homes on the market. The dark red line here is the curve for this year. You can see the dots are the forecast uh, in the model for the rest of the year, each week for the rest of the year. We anticipate a few more weeks of rising inventory uh, in September. Last year, inventory didn't peak till first of November. And I anticipate that it'll peak before that this year because the change in rates hasn't been as dramatic uh, as it was last year. Last year, they went from like six to six and a half to seven to seven and a half really quickly in September. So that change isn't as dramatic. So I don't expect this. And you can see the slowdown that we are showing right now isn't quite as uh, abrupt as it was last fall, but there is some slowdown in the data right now. So we have a few more weeks of late season inventory gains. We'll probably end the year with uh, about 460,000 single family homes on the market. That'll be about 8% fewer than last year this time, uh, which which um, you know really shows us that if uh, 2024 has, for example, if more the mortgage rates start easing back down, uh, 10 months, beginning of the year, even through midsummer, a lot of mortgage rate forecasters were assuming that, say, five and a half percent mortgage rates would be common for 2024. That's uh, now it seems more like more like they're more likely to be talking about eight percent. So but if we see five and a half percent rates, now you'll see inventory fall again. We have demand for those homes. We have fewer homes for sale than we have the demand. And so that will uh, increase demand and not increase supply as much. So inventory will fall. 8% rates will likely see us in uh, in uh, climbing inventory year over year for 2024. That's what the forecast looks like right now. We do change this forecast each week when the latest data comes in. And you know when rates spike and inventory spikes in September, that changes the model based on uh, compared to previous year expectations. All right. So one of the reasons that uh, inventory is uh, climbing is that demand is weaker. Uh, the other reason that inventory might climb would be because we have new we have us we have more listings we have sellers who are maybe panicking or uh losing their jobs or something like that that would would cause sellers to uh, list their homes uh, what we can see here this is the each week is the the rate of new listings the total number of new listings uh and the height of the bar is more homes for sale 
each week. The light portion of the bar here are what we call the immediate sales. So these are the ones that are getting offers and going into contract essentially immediately, like within a day or two uh, of actually listing. And so this one, this chart shows us both supply and demand. What we can see is that there's really no signal anywhere in the data of a flood of sellers. Um, you know, the you may have buyers or sellers on the sitting on the fence, probably buyers sitting on the fence saying, I'm going to wait uh, for the crash. I'm going to wait because uh, there's sellers that are panicking. I'm going to wait because Airbnb owners are going to have to sell their homes because they can't, uh, they, they don't have anybody in there. Uh, these are all hypotheses that could happen. What the, what the data shows us is you can see how the bars remain short each week, meaning there are no, there's no sign anywhere in the data of any flood of new listings. And you can really see middle of last year, right in the middle of the chart, right after July, there was a, there'd been a pull forward of supply. If you were going to sell in 2022, you did it in the first half of the year. Uh, and then people stopped listing their homes. And so they, and, the, and so the bars got shorter and really um, this is a, a, one of the reasons that the sales rate is low is actually uh, we're supply constrained. If we had more homes for sale, we would have more transactions. Um, we can see that the demand is lower. Last year, we still had a lot of, you know, we had we had momentum from the first half of the year still going on. There were 17,000 immediate sales in this week last year, 13,000 immediate sales this year. So it's demand is uh, slowing. It's slow down. It is, uh, but it's not slowing as quickly. And you can see last year how the how abrupt the drop off of new supply and new demand was in the fourth quarter, which we're about to turn to right now. Uh, here's looking at those new listings per week, each comparing each year. So the dark line here is this year, and you can see how many fewer homes we have new listings each week than we have had any recent year. Last year, the light red line started dropping very low at this point of the year, right? So we, we could see after August last year, then we were at record low. This year, we're at com continued to be at record low all year long, record few homes being sold. This year, we had a little uptick in the data, uh, but it'll start seasonally dropping off through the through October, November, December, the fourth quarter there in the, at the right end of the chart. So um, again, like the the uh, there's no signal anywhere in the data of new supply coming in. So um, when there is, and maybe that's a slowdown in the economy, people lose their jobs, maybe it's Airbnb sellers, whatever those things are, um, you'll see it here each week. And we'll see it's the, that new supply, new sellers start to tick up. Um, and we just we just don't have it yet. My guess is that we're going to follow a normal seasonal curve from here on out, and that the next opportunity is really January before we get a reset and see if we can get if if sellers are uh, in the market next spring. There isn't really a ton of signal for that because um, the the same dynamics tend to be in place. It'll be fascinating to see if mortgage rates, we roll into January, mortgage rates are 8%, what that does for sellers. Um, but uh, as of right now, no signal of any surge in sellers. And so that leads us to the sales rate. This is a chart of the single family homes that are in pending contract each week with a with the light portion of the bar, the new contracts each week. Um, last year, there were 390,000 home sales pending. Uh, this year, there's 345,000 total single family homes in contract right now. Co and homes are in contract typically 30, 45 days. So a house that's in contract now might close in October. October or even November. And so when you're you're looking at the headlines and when you're communicating with your buyers and sellers about the headlines, these are headlines that you're going to start seeing in November and December uh, that we can already see that the headlines at that time, there's nothing in the data that's going to be uh, showing a, a, sur a surge in sales or a pickup in the sales rate. So the headlines are going to be pretty bearish in terms of numbers of sales that complete. Um, and so I think 
I think it was yesterday, today, NAR released their their um, seasonally adjusted home sales numbers, and it was pretty close to four million total, a really low. And I've been hoping to see this number climb, uh, so that we could forecast a rise in that that NAR uh, seasonally adjusted number when they come out in the end of the month. But there's really been none, no rise in the total number of volumes here. And so what we see is uh, that, you know, we're 10% fewer new pending sales, only 59,000 uh, this week, 10% year over year, 10% uh, fewer year over year. And I've been hoping that would close. In the, in the fourth quarter, you can see how um, sort of the middle of the chart here, that sales rate dropped very quickly in October, November, December. So we could maybe get ahead of that pace. Um, but right now the the market's cooling here now too. So it it doesn't it, it it's I'm just not super confident that we're gonna end the year with with more sales than we ended 2022. Um we're running 10% fewer still. The um and here's what we look like if we look at those those uh pendings each week, and you can see the that the dark line is this year compared to last year. In the first half of the year, we were closing the gap. We started with like 35% fewer homes and we were closing the gap to about 10%, but we've been unable to get more than 10%, uh, you know, that last 10% over the, over last year. Maybe that gap closes at the, at the far right end of the chart in the fourth quarter. Um, but again, we're supply constrained. So even the even if demand, if rates tick back down and demand picks up, it's really hard to get more than that um, number of of deals done because there just aren't those homes for sale. So forecast wise, you know, I can imagine that the headlines are going to be still around four million seasonally adjusted sales through the end of the year because th those homes are the sales are in contract now. Uh, we can see on the days on market, the, the market time of homes is ticking up, starting to itch up in the second half of the year. Last year, we'd gone from record low and was prices or uh, days on market was climbing pretty quickly. It was climbing all across the country and some of those markets pretty dramatically. This year is a much more slow pace to increase. Uh, but you can see that it's starting to tick up for the year. And about it's about two months, just under two months, month and a half for uh, homes on the market, uh, market time uh, for sales, uh, median across the country. Uh, and I'll show you in some of the local markets where the uh, where the price points where things are moving more quickly than that. And some surprising ones in the local market. So stick around for the local markets. The uh, prices, the median price of single family homes in the US is now $444,900. That is unchanged from last week. It's up about 1% over last year. Um, you can see in the chart here, the dark red line is you know multiple years. It's median price. So we look at every home in the country for sale. We can see exactly where they are priced. And last year, you could see that uh, September, October, you, prices were about to start ratcheting down very quickly, week by week, all the way through the end of the year. The curve, the price reduction curve for the, for the seasonal curve this year is much more slow than last year. You can see how it, the, at the far right end of the chart there, it's like much uh, flatter. And so home prices are up about 1% year over year. You can imagine that we will, home prices will stay in that range, 1%, 2%, 3% over uh, where they ended a year prior. Um, if rates were to jump to say 8% in the fourth quarter, I think you'll see the adjustment like you saw last year very quickly to that. Um, so assuming rates stay in the 7.3 range where they currently are, and then I would imagine like the forecast is that that will the will end the year with home prices up a fraction year over year. Uh, and we're also looking at that roughly for next year. Um, you can because inventory is down year over year, 
Um, there's no uh, there's no supply side that would indicate prices falling, pushing prices lower. Uh, but also we know that demand is low. So there and affordability is really tough. So there's no there's very few uh, signals pushing prices higher either. So you can imagine another year of roughly flat home prices in 2024. The price of the new listings, that's the light line here. So this is the these are the homes that get listed for sale each week. And we'd like to look at the price of the new listings because it's a really powerful wisdom of the crowds where the crowds are the sellers and the listing agents. And you know as a seller pretty much exactly where to price a home. Any given home may be over or under price, but in aggregate, they know exactly where people are buying homes and they get priced, they get priced to sell. And so when that light red line is ticking down quickly, like it was last year at this time, that's really the signal that we would have several months of those negative year over year price changes that we saw in those in the headlines. Right now, it's moving down seasonally, but but much more slowly. And so that shows us a floor on home prices that is really um uh, these are homes that get listed this week. They work their way, the active market through the next month. They get offers in November and close in December or January. That This is the, the, the lead time that you see with the price of the new listings. And it shows relatively uh, a relative floor on home prices at this point. So it's it's uh, you know as we think about where does the market go from here, it's it's an excellent leading indicator. Uh, and then if we look year over year, how that comes out. So this is the set same price of those new listings, um, and each line now is a year. And you can see for a, for the middle of the year there, prices were lower than they were a year ago. Um, now they are just flat. And I thought for a while in the as we as we rolled into July that we would be at this point of the year we have home prices higher those new listings be higher priced but with a recent rise in mortgage rates that's kept those new listings down so if you are now selling your home you know that rates are at 7.3 and if you want that to move you do it at a slight discount and so the median price of those new listings stays a little bit lower um the median price of the new listings fell pretty rapidly from this point through the end of the year last year. And so uh, because that, that was where that big spike of rates was. And so we could end up the year with a little bit positive here, too. So this is why another signal that we're looking at to one, two, three percent home price gains by the end of the year. Uh, let's look at the price of the homes in contract. So now we're talking about the pendings again. And we can see here uh, the newly pendings versus the total pending. So like the price of the newly pendings each week, these are the these are the offers being made. Where are the offers being made? And right in the middle of the chart last year, right? Mortgage rates had just spiked and suddenly the offer prices went down, 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 down uh, several weeks in a row. And you can see that big adjustment in there. Uh, right now we're in a we're in the middle of September in this sort of flat zone. Uh, and they came off their recent peak because July was a recent peak and that's when rates started climbing again. So we could see how the offers adjusted lower this summer at the far right end of the chart here. Uh, and then the, uh, and so then the question is like, how sensitive are consumers to rates right now? And I think what we're seeing is that consumers at this moment are sensitive to changes in rates rather than the absolute or more sensitive to the changes, meaning uh, if rates stay at 7.3%, you can imagine we'll have a seasonal decline in, in those prices, but not a big adjustment down. If the, If rates move up or down, then the offer prices adjust really quickly too. Rates jump down, people will go, oh, I can offer on this other one, the more expensive one, and the prices shift up. So that's really what, how we can measure that really quickly, the sensitivity to those rate changes. And you can see it in that, that point last fall uh, where prices were about to adjust down really quickly. And that's exactly year over year where we are now. Um, and now these are the newly con newly in contract. So each week we can see that same uh, price point last year that that 
the newly contracts were about to adjust down um, and were roughly the same price, you know, flat, maybe it'll be up 1%. And maybe in the fourth quarter, we will finish the year up uh, in the uh, in the contract prices as well. Uh, the last bit of data here, if, before we switch over to the Alto system and then looking at the local reports, is the price reductions. Uh, there are now 36.6% uh, of the homes on the market have taken a price cut. Uh, this Each line is a year in this chart. This is a year-over-year -year chart. And... You know, if you've been on these webinars this year, you've seen this the 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 this year's price reductions curve started about forty percent and declined all year long. And you can see how it got back from cold into the normal range. Remember, normal is about a third or thirty percent of homes take a price cut before they sell. Uh, sometimes that's intentional, sometimes it's accidental, strategic, doesn't matter. About a third take a price cut before they sell. And when price cuts are at 40%, that means that there were more homes that were overpriced than thought they thought they were. So they more people took price cuts. When price cuts are down in the 20s or like during the pandemic in the teens, then even those people who are like, fishing for high offers, got their high offers. They didn't have to do price cuts. So you can really tell where the demand is by watching the price reductions. You can see the light red line here last year where price reductions were climbing so rapidly. In starting, you can see that the, the change starting in actually in February, March, you can see when, when the demand started to, to break and then really in April and May last year. Um, and then you can also see this moment compared to last year, where last year at that, that moment of the rate spike, those homes that were on the market, a bunch of them didn't get offers. They had to do price cuts. So price cuts accelerated in the fourth quarter into this unhealthy zone. And, uh, and so the question is, will price cuts accelerate like they did last year? Last year, they were already at like 38%. Uh, now we're 36.6%. We uh, ticked up this week. And I think we're going to see a few more weeks of price uh, cuts. I don't foresee that extra spike back into the 40s like we had last year uh, because um, the while rates, well, are are high and making things uh, uh, unaffordable, difficult, those payments difficult. Uh, consumers, as I said, are sensitive to changes in rates more so than they are the absolute level. So home shoppers are now shopping. People in the market are saying, okay, mortgage rates are 7.3%. What can I afford for 7.3%? If rates go to eight, it changes those calculations. Fewer of those people make offer, more of the homes that are on the market take price cuts. If rates go to seven or to six and a half, that changes the calculations again. There are more offers that get made and fewer price cuts that have to happen. So uh, you can see that the consum consumers are really sensitive to those rate changes right now. Um, and so what? Uh, while I don't have an ability to forecast rates, as do they go to eight or to seven? I don't, I don't know. But um, we do see at, in the data right now, uh, more price cuts in the next few weeks, uh, not as accelerating as, as much as last year in the same way that inventory is climbing, but not going to be uh, as peak as, as it did as late as last year. Um, and those are tied together. We see some buyers, we see total number of transactions is low, um, but the buyers are shopping at 7.3%. They know what the rates are. Uh, and unless we see another spike in rates, we're just going to have the continued slow. It's going to be uh, slower than previous years. For a while this year, we could see that we got fewer. We had fewer price cuts than 2019 or 2018. It was the the market was was picking up, but then but then rates started climbing again, and so uh, our our market adjusted more slowly. Okay, so that's some forecasting through the end of the year and a little bit of what we can see in 2024. Let's now take a look at price cuts and look at the local levels and see 
what, uh, which of those markets are have the most price cuts around the country? This is the Altos research system. This is the market report system. Uh, I, uh, in here, this is my Mike's account, which is a national account. And I have reports for the whole country. We have my contacts that get the, the reports uh, and, and the campaigns. And I have how many people are opening them. This is how we communicate with the market data to our buyers and sellers right now. So you want to put the market reports, the local reports at their zip code in their inbox, if they're existing clients, if they're on the fence, if they're past clients, everybody has an opinion and wants to know what's happening. So you can put that market report in their inbox each week. What I'm looking at here is the Altos Advanced Analytics System. And I have a query set up uh, for a bunch of things that I like to keep my eyes on, but one of them here is the percentage of homes with price reductions, the top 50 markets around the country. These are big markets around, big metros around the country. And what I like to see is if I, I look and I can see which markets are slowing them most quickly. If you remember last fall, if you were on these last fall, you could see in these little spark lines, look at how, how quickly the the price reductions in Austin were climbing last year. They went from 10% up into the 60s. Uh, Austin went from being one of the lowest, fewest markets with price reductions to the to the most last year. Uh, and what happened is Austin recovered a little bit this spring, but Austin is probably the slowest market in the country right now. Has the most price reductions of any market of any big market in the country. Uh, and also has more inventory than it has in recent years. Austin is one of the few markets around the country that has more inventory than it has any time in the last five years. Um, and I'll show you a few more things on that list. The This list of price reductions was interesting. Earlier, last fall, the Western U.S. markets, Austin, Denver, Colorado Springs, Salt Lake City, dominated the price reduction. So last year, those markets, the Western US markets slowed the most quickly. They went from the hottest boom markets to the slowest markets. This spring, uh, the Florida markets were the dominant uh, most price reductions. But what's happened again, as rates have gone up this fall, we can see that the Western US markets are starting to climb again with the most price reductions. And we can we can see, remember that that you know 30 or 35 percent is normal uh, price reductions. In Austin, normal is probably more like 40 percent. So 51 percent is more than normal, but it's it's half the homes on the market have taken a price cut. That's a significant slowdown for transactions that have yet to occur. Uh, so we can see then uh, those around the the country. We can see that stack in there. There's a couple other uh, uh, things that we can look. And let's look at inventory at the state level. So I have uh, the ranked, all, all the states ranked by how much available inventory of single family homes they have on the market. Uh, Texas is fascinating, Austin. Um, and Texas, you can see in the spark line, here's three years of inventory levels. And inventory in Texas you know, went from 25,000 homes last fall to 70,000 dip, dip down. And now we're at 80,000 single family homes on the market in Texas. You can see higher than any time in the last few years. But look at California. California has always has a chronic shortage of inventory. It's primarily due to the fact that, tax, that Texas has high property taxes and, and California has ultra low property taxes. And so what happens is the holding costs in Texas are higher. Therefore, I have to sell more homes. I, it's more likely to. Where in California, the longer you hold on your to your home, the better your tax deal is. So, uh, so people hold their homes forever. They hoard real estate in California. But so we can see is while last year there was a surge of inventory, this year has not come back. In Texas, inventory has climbed back and is at multi-year highs. California is not. Most of the country is not at the at the highs. And in fact, some of the country, when you look at like, uh, you know, the east and northeast is still at pandemic lows. So New Jersey 
only 9,000 homes on the market in New Jersey, half of what it was a few years ago. It's really fascinating to see how much of the country is in that case. Um, but we can also look and see, so, so Texas is climbing. Uh, you can see the Colorado climbing. We can see Louisiana at multi-year highs in in homes for sale. Really fascinating. You can see those regional that those regional impact there. Let's switch to some of the local markets. I've been talking about Austin. Let's uh, let's dive into Austin more specifically. Austin is uh, inventory is climbing and prices are still adjusting lower. This is. Uh, in this is an Altos report. I've got it at the at the metro level, but you can do any city or zip code in the country. These are all this is branded for Altos, but you know, as as a professional who needs to communicate with the data, this should be branded for you, and we put it in your clients' inboxes. If you, by the way, if you want to go get a full demo of the Altos system, uh, click through. We do free consult. Um, the Lael and Jeff will put a link in the chat. If you want to go get, if you haven't spent the time to look at the data for your local markets, go click through book some time with our team. And we can go talk about how that's, that's working for your markets, how you can communicate with the data to your local clients. So I encourage you to go do that. I'm looking at the Austin market here. Um, we can see that, uh, the market action index is funny. It still says slight seller's advantage. And so you might say, Hey, in Austin, it's, it's buyer's opportunity here like this, but really in Austin, there's actually still not a lot of homes for sale there. It has been a, there's been a, such a booming market for the last bunch of years that, that even balance seems really cold, but that's what the, the market action index tells us. However, we can see, uh, this is the latest, um, latest weekly data for Austin. The median price is 550 K and I have on the big chart here, I have price per square foot. And you can see each dot, the dots are the yearly. Uh, you, so you can see where they were last year at this time. And you can see price per square foot lower than last year at this time, way off the peak. Uh, and back to about where it was two years ago, but still way up over, uh, over three years ago. You can also see in the price ranges in all the, the Altos reports, the high end of the market may be behaving differently from the low end. And you can see, uh, you know, the million three homes in Austin uh, at three months where, you know, down here in the under 400K is more quickly, still moving a little bit slower than than uh, recent years. And that's a that's a really notable change in Austin. Austin was, you know, probably the biggest benefit of the, inbound uh, migration, California migration during the pandemic, the work from home stuff. Uh, and so as that slows with affordability changes, Austin is the market that is adjusting most dramatically uh, slower. And what's fascinating is, you know, the, the, the headlines were all the San Francisco people moving to Austin. So let's look at San Francisco. And we can see in San Francisco a much stronger real estate market. Uh, we can see price per square foot in San Francisco is up year over year. So the migration happened in here from 20 to 21. Remember, this is when, when Austin was skyrocketing and California was stagnant. San Francisco was stagnant pricing. But in the last year, uh, home prices in California have climbed, and, the, and this is the Bay Area, uh, have climbed year over year. And we can look at the inventory levels. And so we can see the inventory levels here in California, in, in San Francisco, still way down from pre-pandemic levels. And really at the pandemic crisis shortage, significantly fewer homes on the market that available than were last year at this time. And let's look down in the price range segments. Look at this in, in San Francisco. These are some of these segments are going in two weeks. You can see exactly where the demand is and the higher end of the market is significantly slower, but still not that slow, you know, in the high end in Austin is 84 days. And so here in, in San Francisco, it's like almost half that. Uh, really a fascinating change 
uh, especially because the conventional wisdom is like everybody in San Francisco is moving to Austin. And uh, that that has changed, I think, dramatically. And I think you can see it in the way people are buying homes. Um, I have Las Vegas up. Las Vegas is interesting to me because Las Vegas tends to be one of the most volatile markets, fastest on the way up and fastest on the way down. Uh, what we're noticing right now is Las Vegas is not as fast on the way down as Austin. And so like, well, assuming now is a down is, is a market where things are slowing. Uh, you would imagine that, that Las Vegas would be one that's slowing as quick as Austin, but it's not percent with price reductions in Austin is or in, in Vegas is only 34%. And the inventory levels back down to the pandemic lows. And I think this is because uh, is significantly more affordable in uh, Las Vegas. Um, and th there may be some of the and, and there may be some of the uh, the California migration still underway to Vegas that isn't going maybe to uh, to Austin. But I'm open to other hypotheses about why Vegas is holding up better this year than last year. In fact, let's look at the price reductions in Vegas last year. Vegas went from 13% with price reductions to had 53, 55% uh, at, at the peak last year, right? This, you could definitely feel that. And while there are more price reductions now, it's a slower market than during the pandemic, of course, it's still not that many. So I, I'm open to hypotheses why uh, why Las Vegas is um, not slowing as quickly as the rest, uh, as, as for example, Austin this year, because usually Vegas is the canary in the coal mine. Um, I've got a few Midwest markets up. Let's look at Chicago, Chicago area. Um, the Midwest, I pointed out New Jersey earlier, where New Jersey is at, um, at, at pandemic lows in inventory. So in Chicago, uh, we still have, we have inventory climbing in the last few months, 9,000 single family homes on the market in, in, in Chicago. Let's look at the big chart here for inventory, but you know, 9,000, like normally 40,000 and we're at 10,000, like we have way fewer homes on the market in Chicago. In fact, lower, fewer homes now for sale than during the pandemic. Isn't that incredible? And uh, you can see slower across all price points. It's, it is uh, a, it is a, uh, a slower market. And in fact, you can look, we can look at price reductions and see there's a slower market than during the pandemic where things were really smoking, but, but, you know, price reductions are climbing seasonally like they would, but they are still fewer than normal in Chicago. It's really fascinating to me to see some of these Midwest and, and Eastern markets that are still kind of at pandemic lows of supply. This is also why when we talk about the total number of sales, the total sales rate is the total sales rate in the country. The number of homes purchased is supply constrained. We have 70, 60% fewer homes on the market in Chicago now than normal. And, and this, we would have more sales if we had more homes for sale. So uh, it's not just a demand story, even though right now demand is is cooling at the second, uh, you know, this this point with these uh, with higher rates and expectations of higher rates later in the year. And then finally, let's look at Boston. Boston is actually even maybe even um, like a hotter market than than Chicago right now. We can see I've got the price reductions in Boston up and we can see how price reductions went from 10 percent up to 40 last year. Um but we're in the third 26 now. And so this says to me that based on the available supply, there's plenty of demand, homes are priced right, and the good price ones are moving very quickly in Boston. It, it looks like a balanced market. You can also see exactly where the price, um, where the demand is, anything under a million and a quarter or so in the Boston area is moving uh, very quickly. And the expensive stuff is taking longer to sell in Boston. Uh, okay, so we have, I think, a bunch of uh, local markets uh, and and some good 
insight about where things are going. I mentioned earlier, if you are watching the data and you want to learn to talk about the data like I do, one of the first places to go is grab the Altos ebook. It's free, uh, has scripts and strategies, and it tells you about definitions about what the stats mean and how to talk about it. So if you haven't gotten the ebook, I encourage you to go do that. And like I mentioned, if you uh, are communicating to buyers and sellers about the data, go to altosresearch.com, book a free consult with our team, talk about your local market, see how you would set up your market reports to get to the people that you work with now, that you're going to work with in the future, that you have worked with in the past. Like everybody wants to know what's going on in the housing market. So uh, there's a link in the chat. I'm sure Lael will share it. Lael and Jeff will share that. Connect there, do that, do that work so that you can help people understand in real time what's happening and they're not waiting for the headlines. All right, everybody, I'll stick around in the chat. We'll make sure all the questions are answered. Thank you so much. Back again next week.